So now let's turn to finding the inverse for matrices that are larger than 2 by 2. And I want to quickly point out something. Remember how we're trying to find an, an inverse, and an inverse was sort of two-sided. It was a, a inverse is the same thing as a inverse a is equal to an identity matrix. So in other words, I'm taking my matrix and I'm, I'm trying to find some other matrix, but I'm multiplying them on both sides. However, we know that matrix multiplication doesn't work for arbitrarily sized matrices. The matrices have to have the, the right size, right? Like if I'm multiplying two matrices together, there has to be this matching of these sort of inner dimensions. But then if I'm also multiplying them on the other side, there has to be a matching of the inner two dimensions here, which originally were the outer two dimensions. So in other words, what I'm really saying is that my matrices have to be square matrices in order for this to even make sense. And if they're not square, then one of these two multiplications isn't going to make any sense. So in other words, I need my A to be N by N. All right, so that was okay, but we're going to need a little bit more than that to figure out that it's invertible. N by N is going to be a necessary condition, but not sufficient. So I'm going to do something that might at first seem a little bit strange. I want you to start with that matrix A. And I'm going to imagine that we've got some, some particular matrix, say it's 3 by 3. And then what I'm going to do is kind of weird. I'm going to append an identity matrix. So for instance, if I have a matrix A that's like 3 by 3, and then I'm going to append the identity matrix, which is another 3 by 3, then, then what I'm going to get is 3 rows and 6 columns. Okay. Now, let me suppose I take this. And it's a big matrix, and I try to put it in its R, R, E, F form. And it's going to turn out that this always happens if it's invertible, if and only if it's invertible, that the matrix A is going to transform into being the identity matrix, as in the R, R, E, F, the reduced row echelon form of an invertible matrix, is going to be the identity matrix. That's an equivalent property. Now. That's what happens to the uh, to the A matrix. The, the A matrix turns into the identity. But, but what happens to that original identity matrix? So if I think about what my process of putting it into RREF is, I'm doing a bunch of elementary row operations. So for example, I might be multiplying a row by two and then interchanging two rows, a bunch of things like that. However, we saw previously that elementary matrices were the process of taking some uh, identity matrix as your starting point, doing a row operation to the identity matrix and seeing what you get out of it. So as I put this into RREF, I'm starting with the identity matrix and then I'm doing an elementary row operation to the identity matrix and another row operation and another row operation. I keep on transforming the identity matrix. Another way to think about this is if you start with your A, and we know eventually that it's going to become the identity matrix, but by doing a whole bunch of row operations, and doing a whole bunch of row operations is like multiplying by elementary matrices. So like, for example, maybe I multiply by a first one, E1, a second elementary matrix, all the way down. Maybe there's, say, I don't know how many of them, uh, J of them. But then what I have here is a whole bunch of matrices all multiplied together, this is a matrix, uh, I'll call it now for A inverse, but it's some matrix where that matrix times A is the identity. That is going to be the inverse of the matrix A. We also have to check it works the other way around, but it, it will indeed do this. So what have we deduced? This identity matrix, which is just going to be starting at the identity and doing EROs to it, is just this product of elementary matrices. In other words, what I get out of here this is my triumphant conclusion, is A inverse. And that's what I want to get at. I want to know how do I find A inverse? Well, I take my A, I append this identity, I do my EROs until the A transforms into an I, and then whatever's left over is going to be my A inverse. All right, so now let's see an example. I've begun here with a matrix A, and I haven't put in the closing bracket because I'm going to append to it the identity. So one's down the main diagonal, zeros everywhere else. And then what I want to do here is I want to do elementary row operations to the A matrix 
and turn it into the identity. And then the identity matrix that I have here, that's going to transform as well under these row operations. And then whatever it transforms into will be my inverse. All right, so I've done a couple elementary row operations in this step. And what you might notice is that my A part, the, the portion on the left here, it's, it's not the identity matrix yet, but it's getting a little bit cleaner. And the stuff on the right-hand side, which started as identity, it's getting a little bit messier. So let's just keep on going and see what we get. Notice, by the way, that at, at this step, I'm going further than just doing it into REF form because I, I wanted to have the zeros above it. I'm going all the way to the reduced row echelon form. So I'm, I'm going a little bit further than sometimes we might do. One step left. All right, and then correcting just a quick typo I found up here gives me this final form where on the left I have the identity matrix, right? One's all the way down, and therefore I can say that this matrix that I have here, that is going to be my A inverse. And if I want to, I can use that matrix and solve systems of linear equations with it going forward.